There are new rules in this law. It's not, it's, it's a serious matter. It's a constant theme in American history and culture, very deeply rooted in popular consciousness, and a real barrier to progress. So take the uh, foreign policy for all threat. It's a very valuable document. It should receive wide support. In fact, if you look at the polls, as is indicated there, they show that there's a high level of support for some time, the polls have indicated that a large majority of the population thinks that the United States should not take the lead in international affairs. The UN Security Council should take the lead. The United Nations, the United States should follow whatever they decide. There's actually been a, a small majority of the population in favor of abandoning the veto and just following what the general world opinion decides, even if we don't like it. Uh, however, uh, that doesn't mean too much, because there's a major problem. All it takes to overcome this, uh, these popular attitudes is a cry of anguish from the political leadership. They're coming after us. Quickly picked up, picked up uh, the drumbeat in the media, the political class, the uh, punditry, and a population that is already frightened out of its wits, because that's the constant situation, uh, just cowers under the umbrella of power, and it didn't matter what their attitudes were. And that means that if we're hoping to implement a major change in policy, there are a number of crucial objectives, not easy ones. But one is to change a prevailing consciousness that is really deeply rooted part of American culture or part of history. And the second is uh, to establish a functioning democracy in which popular opinion has some role in influencing policy. We're very far from that. Uh, both tasks are crucial and uh, both are by no means easy, easy as we all know all too well. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. So uh, I'm very honored to be here with you. Uh, I'm, uh, you know, I, I do a lot of things, a lot of writing. Facebook and a website I just recently started tweeting. So this morning, my tweet was, I'm sitting next to Noam Chomsky. <laughs> so it's a, it's a real honor. Uh, very, very much of an honor. Um, there's very little that I can add to this document. I think that this is a very important document. Uh, I. I believe that it's the sort of document that faces uh, a couple of possible futures. One is that it will circulate and vanish. Uh, the other is that we use it as an organizing tool. Mm. And if we go in the latter direction, then it actually means engaging people in discussions. Yes. And, and not simply giving it to people, expecting that they'll read it, and, and hoping that they'll provide feedback. But to go to labor unions, to go to community-based organizations, uh, to set up discussions in religious institutions and say, let's talk about this. Let's walk through this. Let's see how you experience this document and how you experience U.S. foreign policy. Um, and also something that I want to talk about, which is internationalism, which I'm distinguishing from the issue of foreign policy. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's really important that we we uh, engage in that, and that, that's my first point. Um, but the major thing I want to talk about is the issue of a paradigm shift, and the paradigm shift helping us to understand why things have become so confusing when we're looking at the world, and why it's often difficult for us to explain to people, regular people, what the hell is going on. Um, when I took over uh, as president of Trans Africa Forum, in 2002, um, I could sense 
this particular problem. In fact, I had sensed it before. And, and the problem I thought was very particular to what was going on in Africa, in the African <laughs> world, but then I subsequently realized it was, it was much broader than that. There was, uh, in, in Trans-Africa, the organization had plateaued. But it not only had plateaued, but that we, we, we reached a sort of strategic block uh, or blockage in that up until 1994, when we were dealing with Africa, things seemed fairly clear. You know, we were united against apartheid. Uh, the end of apartheid was the real end of European colonialism in Africa, the end of white minority rule. And many of our organizations, including but not limited to Trans-Africa, had been focused on that. But what the hell happens when apartheid ends? And, and there was this sort of strategic confusion that existed. But over time, I realized that the confusion was much deeper, that actually we've been undergoing a paradigm shift that I would suggest to you started probably in the late 70s with the rise of neoliberal globalization. And with that, the emergence over time of a transnational capitalist class that has had an impact on uh, any number of other things, which I try to talk some about. There's also been the end of the Cold War, uh, China's uh, decision to follow the capitalist road, the wars of secession in Yugoslavia, the Rwanda genocide, uh, the, the rise of ethno-nationalism as in some ways being one of the, the, if not the main feature of nationalism in the current era, and with it, uh, ethnic cleansing and, uh, and genocide you know, you know, Clausewitz made that ex uh, had that expression, war is politics by other means, and I'm starting to feel that genocide is war by other means. Mm. Uh, that, that what we're looking at is this, uh, this linked with the issue of ethno-nationalism and ethnic cleansing, is the racialization of entire populations and therefore the ease with which it is that people are eliminated, pure and simple. Um, now, this change in the situation has brought with it a whole series of complications because it's not always easy to figure out friends and enemies. And there's many people in the progressive movement that I would argue have fallen back into, sorry, they have fallen back into a sort of knee-jerk anti-imperialism. And the basic idea being that if the US is on one side, we've got to be on the other. And this leads to some really interesting problems, like what is our stand on uh, President al-Bashir in the Sudan? If the United States is attacking al-Bashir, condemning him, and identifying a genocide going on in Darfur, does that then lead us to the conclusion that we should support al-Bashir? Let me go even further, something that's become increasingly controversial. It's called genocide denial. In the case of Rwanda, there's been an increased current within the left and progressive movements for people to outright deny that genocide took place in 1994. And there's sort of this reverse engineering almost. It, it begins sort of like this. If Paul Kagame is currently an ally of the United States, and if Paul Kagame is using uh, genocide, the issue of genocide, as a way of suppressing the <coughs> And if Paul Kagame is leading forces that are interfering in neighboring countries, therefore, therefore, the genocide actually didn't happen. The genocide was provoked by Paul Kagame and the Rwandan Patriotic Front, and the Hutus were victims. Now, this may sound really perverse, but you just look it up. Right? And, and it's, it begins with this very weird situation of saying that because the United States is on one side, therefore the other side must be the ones that we have to support. And, and so my, my, uh, my point here is that in the absence of real concrete analysis, we fall back into simplistic approaches to the international situation that don't match with reality, and that regular people out there know is ludicrous. 
So when we're rethinking our work on internationalism, there's a few things that we have to do. It seems to me that one is, uh, as pointed out in this document, and, and for those of us that are uh, Star Trek fans, it's adherence to the prime directive. The prime directive is not interference in the internal affairs of other states. But that directive is a directive from one state to another, because she there's another issue that we have to figure out, which is what is the character of internationalism in the 21st century? What is the obligation of social movements towards other progressive social movements? When we see social movements, progressive social movements, being slaughtered, do we say, well, you know, nothing that we really can do. You know, that shit happens. Uh, you know, it's really unfortunate. We just sit back. Is that what internationalism means? Because if that's what internationalism means, what that is actually called is isolationism. And I think we, we are progressives have to be very, very careful about that. Um, now that leads us into a very difficult area because it really means that when we're looking at both foreign policy and internationalism, we have to understand that part of what we're engaged in is actually fighting for reforms in US foreign policy. This document is proposing reform. It's proposing that foreign policy under the current situation is actually handled differently. Now, there are many progressives and leftists that actually don't believe that that's possible. I mean, after all, we're living in the heart of an empire. We're living in a country which is the repressive arm of global capitalism. And therefore, there are those that say, well, we can't actually carry out this fight. And if that is the case, then we, then, then in a peculiar way, the situation is almost hopeless in terms of developing a constituency, a mass constituency. Because in, or if we want to develop a mass constituency, we actually have to be speaking with people about the concrete ways in which US foreign policy can be changed now. That there are steps that people can take now that actually can have a real world impact. And that becomes incredibly important. That means that we have to integrate this into the work of other social movements. It means that it's not just the peace movement, the end of the peace and justice movement, standing alone and a cry in the wilderness. It means integrating this into the work of the trade unions. It means integrating this into the work of the climate justice movement. It means integrating this into the fights around austerity. And it th therefore it means that we're taking up the issue of foreign policy as, in fact, a reform struggle in a very, very hostile environment. Um, I, I want to build on something that Professor Chomsky said about fear. It, one of the things that was characteristic of the uh, midterm elections was the, the Republicans were appealing to the sense that the world is out of control. And, and it's, it's not just fear, although I absolutely agree with everything that Professor Chomsky laid out on that. It's, it's this notion that we somehow can control, not just own, but can control events. People were furious that Obama could not control the outbreak of Ebola. <laughs> they were furious that Obama could not stop the emergence of ISIL. They were just absolutely furious about this. That, that, that this, this joke that Boehner uh, made a few days before the election about if George Bush was still the president, he would have punched Putin in the mouth. I mean, it's, it's this sort of cowboy idiotic approach, but it's this idea of actual control. People in this country understand that there is chaos out there. They are fearing. They are fearing a number of things, but they're fearing that the world is out of our control. That there are things that we can no longer do. There are steps that we can no longer take uh, because we actually uh, don't own it all. Um, so what, what should we be thinking about <coughs> in implementing this document and, uh, and going forward. So uh, I'm in agreement with the issue of the non-interference. But I would say that a second thing that's not, it's only generally mentioned in the document, is this issue of internationalism. 
that we need to have a discussion about what is the character of 21st century solidarity, international progressive solidarity. So for example, it seems to me that one aspect is certainly fighting to influence governmental policies that help progressive social movements gain the space that they actually need. A very obvious case in point of that was the work that was done in the anti-apartheid movement to assist in the anti-apartheid struggle. What else does this mean? Well, material assistance to progressive forces. That could take various forms. I mean, maybe there will become, become a time again when there have to be international brigades, as there was in the case of the Spanish Civil War. But there are things that, for example, the Boycott Divestment Sanctions Movement, which is concrete material assistance to, uh, to a struggle. And it's a demonstration of, of actual solidarity, and it's not just words. Um, the fight for multilateral aid and intervention, where appropriate. For example, when the Rwanda genocide went down in 1994, it was the United States that obstructed <coughs> international intervention to stop the genocide. But mo most of us on the left were really silent about what the United States should do. Should it have spoken up? Should the United States have joined with it and encouraged the UN to have done something? I would say yes, that that is actually a form of solidarity. It's not the coalition of the willing and the invasion of Iraq, but it is respecting international law and international institutions. And finally, the pushing for nonviolent and just solutions as all part of a notion of 21st century, 21st century internationalism. The, the final point I want to make is, uh, is this. It's somewhat tangential, but I feel uh, I have to make it, which is that we progressives have to really keep in mind, and it's become very evident when you've looked at developments, for example, in Thailand, uh, the Ukraine, Russia, that not all mass movements are progressive that there are very, very bad people out there. And they can often number in hundreds of thousands, if not millions. Now, we should remember that, because the Nazis weren't just you know, 5, 10, 15 people running around with, you know, with uh, machine guns. We we're talking about a mass movement. But we've somehow forgotten that. And I think part of that has to do with the phenomena after World War II where there came to be this general identification of these, these mass anti-imperialist movements were on the move, et cetera. In the period since 1990, certainly we've seen the rise of some very ugly right-wing mass movements. And these right-wing mass movements sometimes say things that sounds like they're left-wing. Mm -hmm. And they sometimes implement tactics that make themselves actually look like they might be progressive. Case in point, these reactionaries in Venezuela that were trying to oust the government and were carrying out these, these, these activities that were being covered in, in the US press. And there were many progressives that became very excited and saw this as some sort of progressive movement. Or you look at Thailand with the rise of something that I think could probably be accurately described as a neo-fascist movement. But it is very mass. Right? And we, when we're looking at looking around the world, what we have to understand is that we have to dig deeper than the external appearance. We have to, it, it, more is called upon of us to, to dig deeply, to understand what the phenomena is, and, and uh, to borrow from great person once to never forget the class struggle. Thank you very much. Provocative thoughts. Some we may agree with, some we may not. Uh, but let's get this gumbo stirred up. I want to I wanna ask a question to get it, to get it started. All through U.S. history, there's always been a tension between those in the ruling circles um, who want a republic 
and those who want more of an empire. And since World War II, it's, it's really it's clear what the balance has been between those who want in the ruling circles a republic and those who want an empire. What's your estimates of the balance of forces in the ruling circles today? You know, paint a little bit of a picture of what we're up against in building this movement for a new foreign policy for all. <laughs> well, I think if you take a look at the political class, the, uh, there's basically no debate. I mean, it's uh, the only opposition you can detect to uh, running an imperial system is uh, a great right the libertarians. But it's worth remembering that these are also people who want to uh, turn uh, power over to unaccountable private tyrannies uh, who, with no uh, role for the population other than to suffer under their rule. They may not put it that way, but that's the effect of allowing, of eliminating any of the constraints on corporate power, which is the primary goal. So yes, on the one hand, they are opposed to Rand Paul, who is, uh, has been pretty eloquently opposed to uh, uh, interventionism and uh, militarism and calling for uh, uh, reduction of the military budget, but there are other aspects of that program that can't be overlooked. But I think it's pretty hard to find any uh, serious anti-imperial sentiment within the, uh, roughly speaking, the political class, uh, those who uh, are the managers of foreign policy, those who write about it, and uh, so on. The only question is, uh, how do we do it? For example, it's hard to find anyone, try to find someone, who has suggested that in the case of ISIS, uh, we uh, follow international law. That is, appeal to the UN Security Council to declare a threat to peace, to organize uh, actions to respond to what really is a monstrous organization, there's no doubt of it, and to create a coalition of people who can actually participate. So if you take a look at uh, Obama's coalition, and there's no, I can't see any objection to this, it excludes the main force on the ground that is fighting against ISIS, namely the PKK, the, uh, the Kurdish uh, resistance forces, Turkish based, they have to be physically based in northern Iraq, southeastern Turkey. Uh, the, the Turks attacked them, the Turkish government.